everyone. Welcome to Dispatches from Quarantine. Today we are talking about uh, publishing during the plague years with Max Booth III, Molly Tanzer, and Vanessa Faselka. Follow all of this stuff going on at dispatchesforquarantine.com. Today we are talking about publishing and COVID. And we have with us uh, an amazing roster, incredible roster of writers, all of whom had books come out during what we might call the COVID era. And uh, as it turns out, things don't go all that great when there's a worldwide civilization threatening plague and you've got a book coming out. So I'll, uh, we'll go around in alphabetical order. I'll ask you to introduce yourself briefly and what brings you here. So alphabetical order, that would be Booth comma Max is first. Hello, Max. Hey. Hello, thank you for well, calling me incredible. I'll always remember that even as I'm dying. Um, yeah, I had two books come out in 2020 and I also somehow got a movie made the same around the same time. So I imagine that's why I was invited. That's right. Just about the movies. Absolutely. Thank you for spoiling everything. Uh, Max is talking about his movie, We Need to Do Something, which is also one of his books. And I'll put the trailer. Please don't watch the trailer right now in the chat. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think it's on Hulu. It is on Hulu, yeah. Um, at least in the U.S. I don't know about elsewhere, but you can also buy it on DVD and Blu-ray if uh, you have something you can put that into. I haven't bought a DVD in about 12 years myself. All right. <laughs> Next up is Tanzer, comma Molly. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a book come out in April of 2020, um, which was, uh, an interesting time, um, because most of what everybody was still talking about was toilet paper. And so, um, it was, uh, it was a curious time for that. And I also, um, ended up winning an award for the book and the next year for and the next year, uh, the pandemic was still so active that the award ceremony was also online. So, um, it was just a very interesting experience, um, soup to nuts. So, all right. Um, and the so book is uh, Creatures of Charm and Hunger, if I remember correctly. Yeah, sorry. Yes, the title is Creatures of Charm and Hunger, which was the third in my series. Um, so it was just the third book anyway, but at the same time, I was attached to it. So um, I it was interesting um, trying to manage being like, I did a thing when everyone is like, I got laid off, including me, because I was also laid off in March of 2020. So um, a lot of things were going on. But you can send her dollars right now by buying Creatures of Charm and Hunger at my link. Thank you. And the award you won was the Colorado Book Award. That's true. Yeah, I did win the color quizzically in the historical fiction category one that is definitely about demons, but um, <laughs> they were very confused by it. And so was I. So there it is. All right. And uh, definitely not last nor least is Veselka, comma, Vanessa. Hey there. Uh, I also had the uh, wondrous experience of putting out a book into 2020 and um it was one i'd worked on for eight years and expected things to happen with I and, interrupt you vanessa what is the name of your book oh the great offshore grounds the great offshore grounds which will be yeah. in the chat in two seconds thank you um and yeah uh, sa uh same situation hit the arc cycle and everything like that in march of 2020 yeah. and uh with a long book that people were reading on their phones at that point because they killed all the paper arcs, et cetera. So there was a lot of stages and I had the same experience with awards. I got lucky because I was nominated for one and one another, but in both cases, uh, most of the support you get around awards, the, you know, none of it was happening and none of it was going anywhere. So it was as if it, it felt like it didn't happen. It was an interesting thing. So so That's, I think I'm here so I can ask a follow-up of which awards were those, Vanessa? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I was nominated for a National Book Award. Uh, and That's a big deal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. it's It was funny because I said, uh, I didn't say it that way. I For a long time, I, I was like, well, I think I was on the long list. I was on the long list. And somebody said, so you were nominated? I was like, and that was the first time. It was like two weeks later, I'm like, I was nominated for a national. You know, just That's right. Uh, so, I think the, the short list is called the finalists, but you can on the long list, you're definitely a nominee. So you can have that on every book cover from now yeah. on, on your business and, cards. And, and yeah. And my, and my dad uh, said, you know, how many nominees? I'm like, well, there are 10. And he was like, that's a short, that's not a long list. So, um, and I won the Oregon Book Award that year. Oh, wonderful. Two states, two states. Where, uh, how about you, Max? Anything in Texas? Any awards from Texas? No, I've never been nominated for anything. 
All right. And finally, last and least is me, <laughs> Nick Mamatas. I too had a book come out during COVID. Here it comes. Oh my God, my last copy, The Second Shooter. And it came out in 2021. So people were getting vaccinated. People, the thing is, were opening up. But there were still many supply chain issues, such as paper shortages, as Vanessa mentioned. But uh, for me, it was cardboard box shortages. Uh, the uh, this nation of Denmark ran out of cardboard boxes, which meant that my uh, book, The Second Shooter, which I'll put in the chat, was stuck on a loading dot for six weeks, which meant that my book came out not early November when the reviews were coming out and uh, my inevitable little essays that you put out when you put out a book came out. But sometime in December, some random Thursday in December, and I don't know if you've ever been to a bookstore in December, you know, theoretically you have because it is uh, the busiest time of year to buy a book, except that nobody wants to buy a new book by nobody. Everyone's buying presents for their kids or for their spouses. And this is, has many virtues, but present for your child is not one of them. It's a good gift for like that crazy uncle you have who's always talking about like the Kennedy assassination. That's so. right. It's a good book. Yeah. Thanks so much. Speaking of good books, we'll just go through y'all. So Max Booth, we need to do something. Tell us a little bit about it. I can do the same thing you did. All right. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's a book about a family trapped in the bathroom. They go into the bathroom because a chill NATO is passing through. A tree falls through the house and they get trapped inside the bathroom. And the book kind of follows as they all go insane as they try to uh, survive. I did not write it with the intention of it being a pandemic book, but it kind of just fit by itself because they will isolating in this one room and going insane as a family. I wrote it before the pandemic happened and I was sitting on it. And at the time I was employed as at a hotel doing the night shift. I had done that almost a decade and I hated it. And when the pandemic was happening, most of my uh, uh, co vocals were getting laid off and I was uh, convinced I was next. So in a desperate attempt to do something, I just uh, self-released this through my own press on a Saturday night. And what's is... the name of your press? We have, this is, thank God I'm, the, I'm, I'm such a great moderator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the time, it was called Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, which is a terrible name, which is why I uh, since have rebranded as Ghoulish Books. Um, yeah, I put it out on a Saturday night, and it ended up becoming one of my uh, best-selling books I've done, despite uh, just doing zero pre-promo. And it led to uh, becoming a movie, which I can get into now. We can get into later. I don't know when you want to. We'll, we'll go through everybody first. We'll come back to that yeah. movie. First, we'll do the disasters of our lives, then how we recovered. <laughs> okay. So speaking of a book that happens to match the uh, theme of COVID and isolation, Molly Tanzer, Creatures of Charm and Hunger. What's it all about? It's a historical yeah, novel. I brought, I got it off the shelf too. Yeah. Um, here's the book. Um, yeah, uh, it is also about, uh, people kind of stuck in a house together, driving each other crazy, uh, which that was not what was going on when I was writing it, but it was a strange kind of thought um, as it was being released. Um, the book is about um, a group of women who are living in the north of England, um, and uh, they are um, during the Second World War, and one of them is in hiding. Um, she is um, German and hiding, and the other two are British, and um, they're Demon Summoners, it's kind of a high, it's it's the third in a series, so I'm not going to get into it, but um, they are indeed uh, trying not to be discovered doing all these various things they're doing, and so they don't really have a lot of company, nobody comes to their house, they're all sick of each other, um, and uh, yeah, it was even hard to talk about at the time, because that was, I mean, we had no idea in April how long that was going to go on, but people were already starting to drive each other crazy, because it was new at that point to only see your the people you live with instead of, you know, all of your entire social circle and going out and things. So it was very, it was a strange zeitgeist, I guess, of that kind of thing. And if I recall correctly, they were, all oh, the bookstores were closed. That was April. Things had closed just a, a month beforehand. And so what did you do when the book came out? Um, I made some tweets. And I think you might've made a video. Oh, I guess I did do a little reading video in my backyard. That's right. I did do that instead of a reading in person. I did one in my backyard um, and I did it on YouTube and that sort of introduced me to doing things on YouTube. So that became a useful skill um, and that was good. But um, yeah, there was no sort of 
anything. It felt very, I, I didn't even see the book until about two weeks after. Um, like it didn't even come in the mail to me. And I, I'm not quite sure why at that point, but I didn't hold it until much after it had been released. And it actually came to a friend of mine before my copy came to me. So she brought it over and we were in a mask in my backyard and she was like, I just wanted you to see this. And then she was like, I know I was not supposed to do this and like hugged me. And I was like, is this how I get COVID? Um, but it was like a lovely gesture. It was just like a strange moment of like, we don't know how anything works and we're outside, I guess that's what you do. And um, so it was like a all around strange experience. And I did uh, not get COVID, is that correct? I did not get COVID, no. Okay, good, good. I, I'm still, I still have not as far as I, I know. So that is a, we'll see. I mean, who knows? I could have had an asymptomatic case, but I'm. I'm one of the few at this point, so. But I never saw anyone before COVID. I never did anything before this entire thing. So like, what was the change for me? Like, I'm just like rattling around my house anyway, so. Well, you had a job outside the house and then you got- Sure, yeah. but I didn't hang out with those people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're all here now. <laughs> and Vanessa, your book came out late 2020, was it? It came out August, 2020. Right, August, 2020. I remember I was actually working in a bookstore at the time. And the bookstore closed down. I was the event coordinator for the bookstore. And uh, the last time I was at the bookstore was for an event that we did not cancel. And it turned out to be uh, a local author who was a police officer. He's a, a county sheriff. So he spent a lot of his time among the homeless community and that sort of thing. And uh, he had many, many people who were kind of older, who were mm -hmm. big fans of his newspaper column. And I had to get up there and say, please don't touch this man. Please stand six feet apart uh, while you're signing the things. Uh, Please use different pens every time. I've got a, I had a big pile, a big container of hand sanitizer, and I turned around and he's giving away hugs to everybody and people are <laughs> kissing him on the cheek and no one's using the hand sanitizer. There are pens everywhere and the store closed for the day and I went to the Safeway. I got all the flu medicine I could possibly grab or the toilet paper, all the frozen food and walked home for an hour and a half and didn't see anything for months. But when I got back there, when the store reopened, one of the first books I put on the shelf was one of yours. Oh. And then I took it right off the shelf and bought it myself. Thank you. Yeah. So that um, was one copy, but then what happened? So, you know, as you, I will, I'm just going to run through a quick list yeah. um, because it could go into depth on any of them. Um, so it kind of, the whole thing was a COVID experience, you know, uh, it came out in, um, it's already mentioned, like it was where it hit on the ARCs, where it hit on review. So those, for those who don't know, ARC means advanced reader copy. Those are copies put out before the, so, uh, so the, the initial, yeah, let me do it this way. The initial plan for uh, publishing uh, had been that, you know, this was going to be my breakout literary achievement of, <laughs> I'm sort of making fun of that, but like, that was the idea. And uh, that we were going to do a whole bunch of paper arcs, uh, paper advanced copies, as well as, you know, that we were actually going to release a lot. This is going to be a big deal. This is going to be a bestseller. It's going to be a big deal. Well, they were going to try to cross over literary fiction. That always is kind of like, what's literary fiction? But they, uh, so they were going to make a whole bunch of, of paper copies, right? Like a bunch. And they were going, they had a whole review plan. I was supposed to do a massive like book tour. And I have all sorts of problems with how publishing houses do book tours because they do them so stupidly and so expensively to so little effect, but still. Um, so there was all these things that were set up and blah, 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 blah. And uh, March, 2020 hits. There are not going to be paper arcs. Um, there are... Nobody knows what's happening, right? The bookstores are shut. Um, my thing was, I remember just like people are reading on their phones mm -hmm. and they're reading on their phones. 90% of the industry is in New York in the middle of a pandemic where they're waiting for updates. And this is like a 460 page book that goes into like a million places. <laughs> you know, I mean, right, like, it's about long ships. There people that got there's someone on the long ships. There's someone on ship. a boat. Uh, on a Buddhist uh, retreat, uh, people driving across yeah. the country. There's taxi drivers. There's two sisters, and they're uh, they're traveling they're around trying to figure working out. class types. Yeah, I had I had grand aspirations mm -hmm. to talk about. You know, the only thing I ever talk about, which is, does the American project work? You know, uh, in my well, own way. Uh, it's a jury's out. Um, okay. Like, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so to fast forward. Uh, no tour, 
no, you know, all of that stuff. Um, media cycles are intense. Uh, when it comes out, um, bookstores are still closed. It's still way in front of vaccines. Um, and, and then, you know, the nomination came and it kind of saved my butt in terms of, you know, not making me, you know, making, making me have something that somebody will sign me to a book for. Um, but I also shared that experience that you talked about with, you know, last year I was at the, uh, like I was, I wanted to go to the NBA cause I wanted to see what it was like. I didn't realize it was like the fucking Met Gala for books. Like I, you know, and I was like, I couldn't afford a ticket. Even for the, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have $325, you know what I mean? It was like, it was really like, boy, I did miss the ball. And I've got nothing I can complain about to anybody because- Well, somebody, you're here today, this is the complaining panel. Oh, this is the complaining thing. So, you know, it was kind of like that. And then when it came around to the Oregon Book Award, you know, they they always do like tours to libraries and opportunities to travel around the state and- None of that was there, partly because of the conversations that are naturally needing to happen. They did not focus on their fiction writers at all. They Their webpage was full of their judges and who their judges were. Hmm. And so it was a literally four minute announcement on the radio with nothing else attached. Oh. There wasn't, you know, it was literally like four minutes on the radio. They're going to say who won. And that was it. There wasn't a Zoom. There wasn't anything. It was like, huh. And there wasn't anything attended. So it was like really strange. And, um, you know, so there were a lot of different ways that unfolded, you know, and we can talk about like bookstores were afraid to send things. And then they were, you know, there's no end cap space. You only have the front page of the web, you know, website, which is limited. And like all of these other things are part of it. But I also felt that kind of, um, it's true that we come out into all sorts of environments when we publish and we never know what the moment is gonna be. So some of that's just true. And then some of it's like, those aren't chances you get back to. And it's hard to know where to put that sometimes. So I hustled a lot. Yeah. Well, sometimes you gotta put it in a different state. So that was Oregon, but in Colorado, I think things might've been a little different. How was your award experience there, uh, Molly Tanzer? Did you have a Zoom? Uh, yes, we had a Zoom. Um, we. Uh, it, yeah, it was interesting. They told me to block out four hours for this event. And I was like, I don't want to go, but I did because <laughs> you know, I was nominated and stuff. And um, it indeed took like an hour and 45 minutes because of course they didn't think about that when you have an event, people are like walking to the front to get right. their thing. And then they are like, oh, the microphone and like squeals and all these terrible things that people <laughs> deal with at these in-person events. Um, so instead it was just like us on the Zoom. And so it was really like kicking along. And um, so I was actually kind of glad that I didn't have to drive an hour to Denver and traffic park, do the thing and then come back. So that was great, except for the fact that, yeah, like I, I didn't expect to win and um, I hadn't even written a speech, which was kind of amateur of me, but at the same time, I, I winged it pretty well, but like I didn't, it, there was no, I don't want to complain about winning an award. I mean, that's not what I mean. So I totally understand where you're coming from, but it was like dead silence of my house where only me and my cat are instead of like, oh, like, oh, oh, oh. And it was the first award I'd ever won. And so um, I was, I'm, I'm flattered. I think it was great. I have been, I immediately updated my bio online. I mean, I did all the things that one does, but it, it was sort of like a, huh, um, here I am in my sweatpants um, with only my makeup and the top half of me looking presentable, um, you know, hoping the cat hair doesn't show up on the camera. And so it was like a strange, it was a strange sort of disembodied experience of it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I still won the award and, you know, it was great. And, I, but it was a strange, like, huh, this is, this is happening like this, but. And were there opportunities with libraries and such, like Vanessa was talking about in Oregon or were that also shut down because of COVID? Yeah, that didn't really happen um, at all. Um, I had one thing kind of set up and then it fell through because I was actually um, traveling to see my mom for like the second time in two years. And so I could not really um, do that. Uh, but like, yeah, it, uh, it, you know, I have my plaque. I won. So like, great. But at the same time, like I. It was prize money too, wasn't there? 
surprisingly yes which I did not know but a check came later and I was like oh that's cool and a plaque which I also didn't know I was getting and so that was like a whole strange experience of like oh this happened that's right um and so it was it was great but also like maybe one day it might be nice to to trip in front of people I mean I guess I didn't do that so that was you know silver linings and all that um chance the iron orange shirt that's all we ever ask yeah I know right like get it gussied up for once and Both halves. Of, uh, never ironing your shirt Max Booth so what yes. did you do? <laughs> <laughs> so you made a movie huh was that even legal to do I don't know man it was in Detroit uh, what's legal <laughs> well uh, how many was the movie all in the bathroom yeah so how big was it, the cast what's going on the cast was pretty small we had I think we had five total and um this was this the crew as well the crew and the cast we all did this photo after the movie was done. So that was so you're wearing masks. So you were intelligent. Thank God. I'm glad to see that. We all had a mask on. Actually, for the the most the the, the biggest peril of the, the shoot, we also had a we had mask and also a face shield on at all times. Fantastic. So everybody stayed at a hotel in um in Detroit, a Hampton Inn, and the the set was in the same pilking lot in this like office building in the garage of the office they had made the bathroom set so no one was allowed to leave like the property for a month the cast and crew we all stayed in this hotel we would wake up walk across the pilking lot to the set and that was uh, all we were allowed to do, which was a good thing. We were um, tested three times a week because uh, it was shot in October of 2020. So the vaccine wasn't around yet. I um, I found I got to enjoy the sensation of a Q-tip up my nose, something I didn't know I liked until then. But yeah, I mean, the, the cast was limited and we will um, told <laughs> really strictly, do not go around the cast because if any of them uh, show up show up positive, the movie screwed because we did not have the budget to just pause production. I think maybe one person on the crew tested positive and that was week one of shooting. After that, we uh, didn't have anyone testing positive. It was pretty good. Everyone obeyed the policies and we were able to make a movie. I feel like a claustrophobic movie. It was an 18 day shoot. So everyone's trapped in their homes or trapped and working behind masks and you're trapped in the hotel. You can't leave, do anything. And you're filming a film about Being people trapped. who are trapped in small areas. So it's like a Russian doll of three layers. The world, <laughs> you, and them. To expand on that Russian doll, I had just quit this hotel job I hated desperately to go move into a hotel. So, uh, what happened to the guy who got COVID? Uh, your crew members, you all right? Yeah, he was fine. He was. Um, he didn't have much to do with the movie once it began production. He. Was I was more, asking about his health because I don't want to go. I don't. I don't want to see this movie later today and see dedicated to the memory of. Sparky McGee. He's fine. He's, he's fine. Okay, good. He's like, fine. You know, yeah. that says, did the dog die? I'm asking, did the crew member die? He's good. Okay, fantastic. Someone else died, but unrelated to COVID. It was just a badly dis- No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Ten deaths. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, was the film in theaters? Did it ever come out in a theater? Or is it that did, before? yeah. Um, we actually went out to Tribeca. It premiered in 2021. And then they flew me out to the UK for the UK premiere as well. So it did some theater circuits. It was pretty nice. Mm-hmm. I had a, a, I had a great time. I wrote the screenplay as well, and I helped with some of the editing. So I've filled really bad series of <laughs> book adaptations going badly, and um, I can't say that happened with me. Oh, fantastic. And I Max, noticed- can I ask a question too? Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Um, how did it, how would you have done the movie if it wasn't COVID? I mean, setting aside the obvious parts, how much did it artistically change? Not sort of financially, but like, did something come out of it in the process that you had to use that you didn't expect? The only restriction that we encountered had to do, there was like two or three flashbacks in the movie. And one of them takes place at a school and we had a really difficult time getting a school to let us uh, film inside. So it, it changed one scene. But beyond that, the the book and the screenplay are pretty much the same. So it was already written 
to be shot during a pandemic, even though I didn't know a pandemic was going to happen. I just kind of love limited settings. So I was just writing a book that had one of those. And then that happened. Uncanny. So next time, are you going to write a book about a, a Zoom host who gets fantastically wealthy? <laughs> <laughs> just think yes. about it. Just, uh, just an idea I had for you. <laughs> okay. Great idea. So uh, during COVID, what else were people doing? Uh, Molly, your book came out to no bookstores and then the long stretch of COVID. Yeah. How did this impact your production as a writer? I had a hard time with it. Um, I... I got into a routine, but um, the routine was not, it, I don't know. I'm not an introvert or an, I don't really identify either with extrovert or introvert stuff. Like I'm right in the middle. Like I need some interaction with people, but if I get too much of it, I get a cranky face and I have to never see anyone for like three weeks at a time. And so I was really under socialized um, and I had it, it was it was a very isolating experience. My mom lives in Florida. I'm in Colorado. I did not see her for over a year. Um, and, you know, there were friends and people I, I typically see who I did not see. And I struggled a lot with the focus of writing. I mean, it sort of sounds ideal when you think about like workshops and stuff where you go in person and it's like, oh, finally, like six weeks away from the world. Finally, I can work on my writing because I have all these distractions going on. But I didn't I did not find that I um, I was addicted to Twitter. I um, could not stop reading the news. I found everything in the world to distract myself um, from my garden to, you know, my Peloton Zoom workouts and all these things. And when I would sit down to write, I just sort of had the static in my brain. And it was, it was a really crushing experience. And it wasn't until much later that I sort of got back on track with it. And I did manage to produce some things. I I wrote a novelette and I did other things, but in terms of like long form writing, like I, I really, it really affected me. Um, I recall correctly, you've uh, produced four novelettes. Well, I, one of them I wrote before COVID. Oh, so three novelettes, including one that I might have a link for right here. <laughs> I'm going to put in the chat right now. What? Now you can listen to after this. Oh. Oh yeah, sure. I guess, I don't know. I never remember what I write. I was like, <laughs> a lot of this book that I put out during COVID. I don't know. I wrote it in 2019. I have no idea what it's about. Um, but <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I have been working on a novel for a while. Um, the book I've been working on since I finished Creatures of Charm and Hunger, it went through a lot of iterations. Um, and that was, um, I was really struggling with this idea of like writing and the, and the work in progress is set in a huge city where people are going out and doing these things. And I realized I had this draft where everybody was just like going out to brunch with their friends. And like, I was like, no, wait, that's not, that's not a book. That's my, that's what I wish I was doing right now. That yeah. is different. And so I kind of had to recalibrate for what I was writing for in terms of what I was missing and what I wanted to do. And I, I, you know, I'm on a much better track now and I think things have really turned around for me but like it I really struggled um I did not have a very productive time where I was just like oh thank goodness I don't have to go to Target I can just sit here and type but uh two of your novelettes that appear in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and they've both been named to the honor list of best American uh science fiction and fantasy yeah thank you yeah no I mean I think that the work I managed to get done was good but before COVID, I felt like I was much more productive and much more easily productive. And now it, it was different. I um, I did get back into reading a lot. That was something that I do feel like was a silver lining for me was I had, I was able to focus on other things and learn. And I actually set to get set up a little Zoom group where we all read Francine Prose's Reading Like a Writer and we read John Gardner's um, I'm Becoming a Novelist. And so I connected with other writers that way in a way that I might have at cons. Um, so I took the time to sort of turn inward and work on my craft in that way. But in terms of like cranking out the jams, like absolutely not. So Vanessa, you're not a, a, a jam cranker. You had a novel uh, that was great called Zazen 2005, six. No, no, no. Two th not that bad. Okay, not that bad. It came out in summer 2011. And this one came out. So uh, you were one a decade novelist. What were you doing during COVID? That wasn't my intention. <laughs> Part of it is that I left a publisher because mm -hmm. over a disagreement, which was not resolvable, and I didn't want to change the book. And so I walked out of a major publishing house without agent, without anything else, and then had to spend some extra time trying to find a home for it. So it did slow it down some, but there was about seven, eight years of honest work on it. Um, well, what kind of work were you doing? 
You mean during COVID? Yeah. Yeah. So during COVID, I was working constantly and there was no writing. Had I been trying to write, I would have had the experience that Molly's just describing, I'm sure, because I had it afterwards. Um, and uh, so I was working with caregivers in nursing homes uh, as a union organizer and then director of organizing and then also took over the department that it was in, responsible for all the long-term care nursing home uh, contracts and workers. And so my life was crazy during that time. And then uh, also... And in fact... For people who want to know more about this craziness, just by random coincidence, I happen to have a link to Vanessa's New York Times uh, commentary piece on being a long time you know, during COVID that you can check out there in the chat. So one of the things I didn't say in that piece, because like I didn't want to bring, um, you know, I didn't want to get into conversations with people about it, is that uh, I was uh, I was working with caregivers and we were organizing and we were doing it in person because they were already working directly with people. And, you know, there was no vaccine, like they were right in the front of it every day. And so those of us who decided to, and only those who decided to, went into the same bubble with them and sort of, you know, set up to not see our families for two months, you know, and just lived in a bubble with a bunch of caregivers you know, for a period of time. And it was very intense. And, and so my whole experience of COVID in a lot of ways was this difference between like the people I was working with had no break. Like they were constantly caring for, you know what I mean? Like it was so, they'd all had COVID. They'd, you know what I mean? Like it was very, and then this sort of very pristine process on the other hand. So I didn't write, I didn't try to write. And I imagined that the second I was out of that job, that I would suddenly be able to spend the next year getting a draft. And instead, my brain just need that much wind down time um, from the work I'd been doing. And so that was like, so I worked a lot during that year, but I did it, you know, in writing and different things, but like, I wasn't able to get into the next novel yet. So, and had a lot of judgment about myself about that, that still continues in some ways. Never judge yourself. It doesn't help. Yeah. Always judge uh, the world around oh, you. I didn't work. have this before, but I found it. Oh, this nice. There we go. All right. There you go. And the only thing that my final complaint is Knopf doesn't put people on the long list for the National Book Award, doesn't put any stickers or comments. Oh, they only count the short list. And we didn't even get stickers for the Oregon Book Award. So no stickers, no plaques. That's my final. Uh, you're holding up the hardcover, but now the book is in paperback. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So you can get the cheaper version, the paperback. Yes, definitely. And there's lots of used versions. And we're yeah. trying to sell some books here, Vanessa. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't go to the used store for this. There's plenty of stuff in the used store. You can buy out the shrugged seven times if you want in the used store. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the cover, though. So I feel very <laughs> grateful about that. I had a the similar experience with uh, the second shooter which I originally started writing in 2016 and then put aside for several years and then it sold. It's so good. Right before COVID started. And uh, the book briefly is about conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists and interacting with them on a big road trip across the country. And that sounded great. And then I then during COVID, of course, uh, we had both COVID themed conspiracies, that there's a pandemic, that the, the, dia, the uh, vaccines were full of microchips and 5G. And then we had the political conspiracies around the presidential election uh, while I'm trying to finish the book, which I you know, had to finish a third act. And so it had started off as a kind of science fiction, but started reading much like a kind of a almost tedious realism, like documentary realism. So I had to go even crazier. I had to revisit the ending completely when writing this book and, say, and think to myself, how could I make this science fiction and fantasy again? Because the traditional ending basically was what was going on outside the street. It wasn't even the day after tomorrow, near near future. It was seven days ago. And it was a very, very challenging. And then a, a series of dark events happened to keep the book from coming out. So I, I'm like the anti-Max. Max write things down, everything happens great. I write things down, everything is awful. Nick, more story. 
<laughs> talked about paper boxes and <laughs> and and I want to since you've shouted out everybody else's book second shooter's great and um I'm working uh, and, and I'm reading others of yours and I just the humor the intelligence the voice the control it's so it's really cool so well, thank um, you very much but I'm the I'm the moderator of this panel so let's keep it moderate Max after the movie what were you doing during COVID I see well, you got a convention in a bookstore now yeah, I, I, I will say, though, before the movie happened, I was still at the hotel until August, and it was terrible. It was awful. Were people in the hotel? Were there yeah, we, we did not shut down. We lost a lot of employees, and I ended up just getting stuck doing the jobs that they would do without any extra pay. So we lost uh, someone in laundry. So I would then have to spend half, to the, half the night going through uh, sheets and washing them, getting those ready while doing the front desk because at night I was the only employee. And um, also they did a thing, well, they still wanted coffee available in the morning, but they didn't want anyone touching it. So I then had to become a barista and propel every cup of coffee while checking everyone out. And that was going insane because- There's no raise, the, no nothing, nothing for that. And it's like Texas money. So not yeah. a lot of money, right? No, I think I was making twelve fifty. Um, and um, one of the main well, reasons I- 15 to do my sheets. You want to fly <laughs> out? I might do that. I need money desperately. desperately. <laughs> Uh, one of the reasons I stayed with the hotel so long was it gave me some free time to get writing done and um, editing done. But as soon as all, all of this began going on, I lost any any free time to be productive. And I was just nonstop um, trying to get people to have a mask on and then getting yelled at by guests because I'm in Texas and half of the people staying at the hotel think uh, it's some big conspiracy. And it was just a nightmare, even my even like the GM of the hotel, anyone involved in management, they everyone thought the COVID was a joke and not real. So it felt like this like this battle that I could not win because everyone was like, "Why are you uh, overreacting about this? It's fine." <laughs> so I eventually quit because I was going insane, and yeah. um, I I just I had optioned the movie, which was nice, but it wasn't a big chunk of change. But a week after I put my two weeks in with. We, the um the people involved in the movie somehow found the uh, financing so that was a big uh, relief because i had no plan i just decided i can't do this hotel anymore so that was a relief and after the movie happened i spent a lot of time um just treating my small micro press like a like a like an actual business and trying to get in the shape because i no longer had a hotel to distract me and i focused more on screenwriting and i uh haven't had any success with that <laughs> beyond the one movie. Um, beyond but, the one movie, he says. Yeah, beyond the one movie. <laughs> <laughs> Just that. Um, but we also launched a book fest in Texas called the Ghoulish Book Fest that began in 2022. And as of a month ago, we also run a bookshop now in Texas, which I am in right now. Oh, oh wow. Very nice. And yeah. where's the bookstore? San Antonio, Texas? Yeah, it's in Northeast San Antonio in a small town called Selma. Um, yeah, it's focused on spooky books only. So who comes in? Weirdos or kids or what? Yeah, just the strangest <laughs> people you can imagine. I love them. So anybody that participates there, you find yourself in San Antonio, check it out. Ghoulish Bookstore. Uh, speaking of participants, if you have a question, I'm sure you have millions of questions. All you got to do is type them in the chat and I will read them out loud. And this could be for all of us or for any of us. Meanwhile, let's see, we've not talked to Molly in a bit. So how has it been going since COVID has not gone away, but uh, has kind of uh, faded from the consciousness of the world at the very least? Um, it's been interesting. Uh, the publisher I was with for my series um, sold itself and then shuttered the imprint. Um, so... I'm not sure where I'll be next, um, which is freeing um, because I I had an okay time with them, but uh, I don't know if I would have necessarily wanted to honor the option that they kind of maybe had nebulously on whatever I did next. So um, I'm I'm free as a bird. I've um, been picking up a lot of freelance work, and I've been working more steadily on things and. Um, 
I, it's been a good situation. I, I'm still, I'm still in a mask a lot of the time. Um, it's been challenging to see the world go into denial mode, I guess. Um, that has been a really, I mean, we were all in denial. It was, it's always been denial mode with this entire time, but now it, it's really been interesting to kind of like, I'm going to a workshop later this year and I'm going to go to world fantasy. And, um, I'm not really sure how to negotiate that since I'm still, you know, in a mask and Whole Foods and um, oh, the world, world fantasy, the world fantasy convention is an annual convention of people in publishing in the fantasy genre. It's in a yeah. different place every time. I think it's a uh, Kansas, Kansas City, City this year. Missouri? Yeah, Missouri, Kansas City. Yes. Um, and uh, so it's going to be interesting. I feel like I'm challenging myself to do certain things. It's just been an interesting experience since even back in 2021 when I had my first vaccine. Um, I, the science was like, keep your mask on. We're not sure yet. And of course, all the all, Twitter was a buzz of like, everyone was vaccinated at this wedding and then everyone got COVID. And it was just like, what's going on? And so um, I don't know. I, I I feel at odds with the world in a way that I am familiar with by now, but I'm saddened by. I would say that I'm lucky to be in uh, Boulder County, Colorado, because you will see masks still sometimes. And I know there are many places where you won't see them at all, but I don't know. I mean, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons on Zoom before the pandemic. So like that part of my life has gone completely unchanged. Like I still have my Thursday night online game. Um, so I feel like I've been just trying to negotiate it. I, I find things to keep myself busy and Thankfully now um, I'm feeling in a little bit of better headspace with my writing. And so I have that to keep my brain going instead of darker matters. Um, darker matters. Darker Speaking matters. of darker matters, we have our first question. How did publishing negotiations change due to COVID or did they like funding wise? Oh, Vanessa seems excited about that question. Go ahead, Vanessa. <laughs> yeah, so um, people were uncertain about what would sell. So people who were trying to sell books during that time really struggled. Mm -hmm. The thing that those who were published during that time deal with is the fact that we have our sales numbers, you know, will always be held against us in the major parts of the industry, like meaning mainstream publishing. And uh, even though, you know, everybody knows it was COVID, these, this is money. And they only, um, yeah, they can give that pass to a handful of people, very small handful. So numbers for reality, the Times did something, I can't remember the exact thing, but it was basically like literary fiction, you know, 95% of it sold under 5,000 or fiction in general, under 5,000. And there's some complexity of those numbers, but like that, that was the number. So you can imagine that a lot of people um, my numbers are held against me. I just, I just uh, was in a book negotiation, and even though I sold cumulatively seventy five hundred, you know, um, in that time period, it was brought up immediately, you know, about my past sales. So we carry that with us and changes our ability to sort of have leverage there. The other thing is, I don't see the book. I don't see that where they saved so much money on not touring and not doing in, you know, not doing any kind of other, they got to knock out all their paper costs. They got to not, I mean, they got to save so much money in so many different ways that, you know, some of those aren't going to come back and they're certainly not going to say, well, you know what, we're going to take less and <laughs> less in returns to, uh, you know, cause we are not going to have whatever. So and uh, and then the other thing I think is that the move it moved people towards a local um, when people started doing book tours on Zoom. Uh, the problem you run into is anybody can come all over the country. That's great, except for it narrows the number you can actually do, because it's there's nothing special about Atlanta on Zoom and special about San Francisco on Zoom, and so it's it, it's sort of basically makes it harder to build relationships with stores and do things like that. And so, with individuals, I mean, the, the, the individual hand selling. Yeah, my, if you were in a store and you were selling your book at a store as, as an, at an event, what you need to do is grab a copy of that book and hand it to somebody say, hey, check right. this out. Once it's in someone's hands, they're very shy about putting it back. But here, I can paste this link to say, I don't know, uh, offshore grounds again. And will we get from 7,500 to 7,518 with our 18 participants? I don't know. Let's see. When well, I pick it back in, who's going to um, buy the link? You just brought up one final thing, which okay. is the independent book sort relationship of hand sellers. My first novel, uh, hand was 
independent bookstores hand sold at six to one against an Amazon. Yeah. Like it was a remarkable, and I had those relationships and they were intact. And when the book came out, I didn't, all the ways that I knew how to sell a book, all the ways that I knew to do it, I didn't have access to right. anymore. So Max, you basically said publishing can fuck off and you're going to do your own book from now on. And now you are a publisher of other people as well. You're not just a self-publisher. You have a publishing company and you publish many things. So from that point of view, it was this an evacuation attempt or something else? I don't know. I'm, I mean, we had been uh, trying to be a press since 2012. And sometimes we did okay and sometimes we did not. Usually because I it was always something trying to fit into the schedule of having a nine to five or an 11 to seven in the case of the hotel job I had. Something I think happened in 2020. I mean, you know, with reading, I believe, and unlike any previous year, I do think little people wanted to read books because they were stuck in the house. We began seeing a big increase in sales, especially on like the, the website we have because we sell books through the website. And I don't think anyone else was doing anything besides reading. So I think because of that, the business did increase in sales. And I always wanted to try to have the time to treat it like a proper business and give it all my time. And that's what we did, myself and my wife, we both run it. And yeah, I mean, it's... Ever since I quit the job and began dedicating all time and energy into it, we have seen the uptick and people who were just interested in the books we put out and just um, a lot of passion into the spooky stuff we do. And that has led to the bookshop and the book fest. And we have just kind of attracted this odd audience of uh, ghouls that's what I called them. And do you think part of the success is because it's so dark and the world's been so dark with COVID? I don't know. It's possible. I, I, say yes. I don't know. So yes, you're right. yes. You're right. Like, well, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. I'll say that one thing I've not experienced because I've not sold a book since COVID, but what I've heard a lot about are that advances are being split differently. So an advance is an advance upon royalties, if you don't know. And that means you get money in advance that you would get if a book sells on a per unit basis. And you get this in three payments, say one when you sell the book, one when you deliver the manuscript, and one when the book comes out. And during COVID, they said, publishers said, how about how about four payments? Making the advance, not reading the advance, because the fourth payment would come afterward. And now that COVID is in, at least in, culturally in abeyance and economically in abeyance, because every bookstore is open, people are going to see Taylor Swift at uh, stadiums, people are flying all over the world, they still want four payments, which can be very challenging if you're trying to, you know, have a budget uh, to... And I think that's a major, major thing that people who get high advances, I wouldn't know, but I got friends who have high advances or are struggling with. Let's see what other questions there were. Can I go up on my chat? Or how do I just make this bigger and bigger? Let's see. Oh, I can go up on my chat. See, I never okay. zoom very much, honestly. It's a this lot is... of great questions. You guys are great. Okay. Uh, second question, same as the first question, but good try. How do you say strong as a writer when you face self-doubt? I'd love um, to hear the answers for this. Go for it. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> God. What's my question? <laughs> I want to hear. Thank you for answering. Do you want to give it a roll, or roll, Molly? I well, I I mean, my first thought is um, so a coworker of mine at the coffee shop before I was laid off um, once we had this is not my story. I was told the story, but a customer had come in and was a little grouchy about what they had received, and they left in a huff. And he just turned to my friend, the owner, and said. We don't need these peasants to like our coffee. And um, sometimes I think about that um, when I'm writing. I think to myself, I, I don't need these peasants to like my writing. And of course, I want them to. Like, I want everyone to like it. I'm a writer. Like, I crave both isolation and ultimate regard. Um, but I try to tell myself that, you know, like, I should trust my aesthetics, I guess. Um, I I know who I, I, I've been doing this for over a decade, written all kinds of different things. I've been nominated for an awards. I've won one. Um, and I know what I'm doing. And even if it doesn't feel like that all the time, I, I try to remember that, that I that individual interactions don't matter. As long as you keep doing it, you're succeeding. And um, so that is, that's what I tell myself. I don't, I, I, you know, I can do this without 
anyone else. It is something done in isolation. And yeah, I just have to stick with it. I hope that was an okay answer. I don't know. That's a great answer. And the peasants do like your coffee. <laughs> just, yesterday, yeah. just yesterday, when you were, uh, no, but that was on the honor roll of. Uh... Yeah, that was really nice to see. I really enjoyed that novelette. And I, um, you know, it, and, it, and it was one that I did not feel as confident about going into, but it was nice to see that indeed, like it, you know, it got some recognition and that's really nice. And so, and that I wrote, that was probably the most me thing I've written. I don't know what that means, but I mean, it's about like space barbarians and surrealism and aesthetics and all these things. And so like naturally, and so, uh, you know, I, I have to just trust myself because if I'm not going to trust myself, then I'm really lost, I guess, like. And here's a great question. I'll answer this one. On the flip side of uh, what in the writing publishing world has changed since the pandemic that you are happy with? Hope we'll continue. And I'll say COVID as the ultimate reason for, for mistakes and problems. In the old days of working in publishing, it's always very frustrating. Somebody missed their deadline. Somebody, something didn't go right. People were like, well, who is to blame? What's going on? I'm just going to fire someone. I'm going to scream and yell at somebody. And all you got to do is say, well, you know, COVID. Where's the paper? COVID. Why? How come he didn't COVID? And they can't say anything. And of course, COVID is a bad thing. I don't want people to get COVID. I don't want people in the warehouse to get COVID. I don't want people in the bookstore to get COVID. I don't want freelancers I work with to get COVID. I don't want to get COVID. But I really do like the idea that when you say the magic word COVID, the, even the most angry, upset person just sort of backs off. And even if there's no obvious COVID, you can always say, well, you know, long COVID is a problem. And it has taught people what think what really matters, and what really matters is people's health and people's well being and people's ability to be social with one another, and not what seems like a huge issue, a missed deadline, uh, a typo in a book. And it really uh, created a new kind of perspective that everyone has. And just now in 2023, I'm seeing people sort of fight back against COVID. They'll say, "Well, I had COVID," and then I will say to them, "So you must know what it's like." <laughs> and then they have to shut up. So you've got two steps now, but it's still working that people are realizing that the whole world facing something terrible and to just ease the fuck up sometimes is okay. Give yourself a break. And I think that people are giving themselves a break to a certain extent of publishing, at least among writers, freelancers, people in bookstores, not the CEOs and the, the big wigs, but everyone in this panel, for example, is giving themselves a break. I, I do think, that- I do think before COVID, I mean, the idea of like, calling off and not doing something because you feel sick was seen as like this weakling move Mm -hmm. like especially like in movies right you would see like oh they would like almost become like this great um motivated person because even though they will dine of diarrhea or something they still came in and they got it done but it's such stupid fucking thinking and i'm glad that that it's changing like you said and you got a couple more questions here um has the pandemic and its atmosphere had any lasting changes in how you approach your writing vanessa you can say no no i had something <laughs> earlier. i mean it has but i'm not sure it's interesting or helpful it doesn't have to be helpful just interesting <laughs> Molly, <laughs> uh, uh, pass. I don't know. Uh, I, <laughs> yes, I, I now uh, I, I I write. I only write with a mask on now. Even though I'm alone, I have to have a mask on, or I just I can't do it. Really, and and a face shield, or just the mask? Both, oh. but the okay. face shield is uh, facing behind me. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, every time I've seen a Zoom meeting, uh, not this one, but every other time I've been to a Zoom meeting with some writers, there's always somebody wearing a baseball cap inside the house. That's that's just as insane as wearing a face mask behind you. There's no sun coming down. You can I'll take the honest. hat off on Zoom. You're on television. Just take the hat off. I know how much you hate that, Nick. And I definitely <laughs> thought about putting one on before doing this because I know you've talked about it quite a bit and it amuses me how much you If I could that. reach out. <laughs> <laughs> can I... Uh, the one thing I, I'd like to add about the doubt in writing, you know, through doubt, because I really struggle with this. I mean, I really do. And then I don't in another way. And I, I really rely on my experience as a musician, you know, because in music, there's much more of like the idea that you would play a song for someone like who asked to hear a song of yours uh, and they would immediately turn around and go like, I don't think that that bridge works. And like, I'm not so into the experience of you. Like, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like there is a real sense with musicians, like go lightly, dude, have something to say in a different way, you know? And um, so that kind of like, 
you know, back off uh, is in music in a much different way. So I had to bring it together. So what I did is I have a clip, a long version and a short version. The long version is five minutes, the short version is 30 seconds of it, Rocky Horror Show where they bring out uh, Rocky and, um, and Janet says she doesn't like muscles. And you know, he's like, what do you think of him? And she's saying she doesn't really like muscles. And he's like, I didn't make him for you. And so I play that over and over for myself. And when I teach, on, if I'm teaching online in a group setting, I usually start with it. Like, and then, so I have the short and the long verse because I have to just have that quick image of uh, autonomy, of my aesthetics, of my idea, of my focus, of my ability to say no. And I would have published Offshore Grounds that the other thing is, I know how to publish independently. I know how to put out my own book. And I was going to do that with Offshore Grounds, but it was entangled in contract stuff. But knowing that like, look, I've walked away before and I know I can make something and put it out, you know, and my process is done, you know, with that. So that also gives me a sense of power in the situation when I'm feeling a lot of doubt you know I will I'm definitely like I'll eat worms take my rocks and go home um and uh that comforts me that yeah. gives me freedom it's a good segue to the next question because Rocky Horror of course about making something beautiful yet terrible out of nothing for obscure reasons and the question is what do you guys think of AI writing ah Molly's ready do it I mean, my Twitter bio right now does say AI generated media disliker. Like that is like literally right there in my Twitter bio. And I, I think, I guess, man, I really, I do think that there are ethical uses of AI. I absolutely do think that there are like potential uses of it that aren't destructive. Um, like for example, like the DMD group I was talking about, like uh, my DM will often um, use his mid, mid journey, I don't know what it's called, account to um, put into prompts and come up with like weird, what's it like a post-apocalyptic setting? And so he uses it to come up with images of the monsters that he has invented that he's reskinning from just the regular monster manual. Um, and we don't publish that. He's not writing a supplement. Like it's for, you know, a couple of nerds on a Thursday night. And like, we're like, oh, that's weird. That's cool. We can see where that came from. And fine. You know, like that's, I don't have a problem with that. Even if I, in general, am highly against this kind of thing. I, I don't think that's necessarily unethical. I mean, I think the sourcing of it is unethical, but that's not an unethical use of something that exists. Um, but I mean, I guess my feeling about the writing side of it is one, I feel so bad for teachers right now. Like the amount of horror that I see from all of my professor and teacher friends online when they're just like, they don't care. They like the students are just using it all the time. Um, and they, they, they know we're going to know and they don't care anyway. Um, I feel horrible for them. Um, but I do, I guess I do take comfort in a tweet I saw early on, which is, uh, somebody was like, don't worry writers no computer will ever be horny enough to make truly great art. And um, I I think about that um, in terms of like, will it replace me? Like, no, like no computer will ever be as horny as I am. And so therefore I am safe because that's what people are gonna wanna read. At least some people, my readers will um, inevitably, so. And Max, how horny are you? I mean- <laughs> Sorry, Max. A lot, I'm... a lot. <laughs> but um, not as much as my computer, but I did buy it a really odd, place behind a cylindrical k but that's different ai is bad don't do it just just don't do it don't subtract it don't engage in it it's awful i think uh ai creative writing i think we're safe for a while honestly when i've seen people that do generated ai stories they almost never have dialogue they are uh read more like vignettes or summaries of stories there is a uh, no sense of irony in them but for visual art, I think it's going to be a huge problem. It already is to a certain extent uh, in the film industry. People are uh, not hiring freelance concept artists, but are just AIing it and giving it their best work. So things that are kind of preliminary, not final products, but are preliminary generative products, where we're seeing AI being used, we're seeing AI being used in cover art. And I think many people are advancing the idea that as writers that the contract should say, no, no book I publish will have AI cover art. And I, I'm definitely having that in my, my, and I think Molly, you are as well, having that. I mean, did I even get that from you, I think? Yeah, a yeah. little bit. <laughs> I, 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 I thought about it and then other people who actually have platforms were like, we should do this. And I was like, great idea. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I do think it's something that I, I haven't necessarily come up against it at this point, but I, I definitely plan on um, being a stickler about it in any 
contracts I have that cover art or associative art would be like, you know, going forward, because I mean, there's, it's a huge problem. I think um, Clark's World just had a, hu a huge kerfuffle over a cover that, because um, their contract says like, if you submit your art for Clark's World, it must not be AI generated. And whether or not the cover in question was AI generated was not resolved in public, um, but the the artist and Clark's World parted ways. And it was really interesting to see the discourse around it um, because most people in the community in the SF community were like, yeah, like, this is good. Like get them. Like, don't, don't let these posers, you know, jank our C's. And, but then you would see other people um, on Twitter being like, well, I'm an AI artist. Like, how dare you d degrade my art form? Like, it's just as hard to get a good prompt as it is to learn to paint. And um, I, I, is that true? Don't agree with that at all. <laughs> yeah. but, so, um, I'm not a painter. I took up drawing this year as my New Year's resolution. That seems pretty tough. It's May. I can barely if I can draw a pair. Yeah. Um, I can type a pair and get images. <laughs> Vanessa. Yeah, that on that thing alone, you know, uh, I just put it in the chat, but Molly Crabapple has really been spearheading a lot of stuff with this around the image um, creations and, and sort of how it's being mined and all of that, because it's definitely coming for them first. Mm -hmm. I put it in my contract negotiations with Norton on my last round. Um, but I think there's another problem that I see, and I'm probably going to offend somebody on here. So just, you know. Well, we got 20 minutes left, so offend away that we can get some more questions. Okay. I kind of think AI is the new artist's way. I mm -hmm. kind of think that the idea a lot of times that um, everybody is an artist and there's no sort of skill level and, and there's no talent and there's no development is such a denial of um, everybody has capacity. I'm not, you know, but it's such a denial. Like when you see somebody say like, well, I'm the person who thought this one prompt that generated this one thing. When you're skipping all of the stages of learning your craft, you're, um, you're actually saying that the process itself doesn't train a sensibility, not just an aesthetic. Like there is something that happens in the process of learning to work hard on something that changes how you interact and how you make choices and all of this thing. And to say that that's meaningless is not just a technical aspect, it's a misunderstanding of what art is. So I think there is a bunch of like, isn't this cool? Nobody has to actually study anything anymore. Nobody has to actually like, whether it's you're in school or what, you know what I mean? I think there's this whole thing about it that I find, um, I think that's going to be very hard to push back on because there is a, there's a gel. I mean, like the idea of being an artist is cool. It just doesn't pay any, but it pays no money. So you get to do both. You get to be an artist while you have a different job that pays you, you know, as a doctor and you get to be both, right? Like, but you don't actually have to do the work. And and I just, I don't know. I know I'm being a little bit, but I, it, it kind of- No, you're me. awesome. Keep going. Like, keep going. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. How about any participants? Any angry participants out there of the 17 of you? You all agree with Vanessa? You don't have to, don't type anything if you, you agree, just if you disagree. It's hard to keep up. But I agree. And one thing that's come out with this visual art I used to use it when it first came out a couple of times as an experiment that I stopped using it. They want to feed it anymore. But what I used to do to sort of defeat the AI was ask for abstractions. Give me something with a sense of dynamism that reflects ennui. Couldn't do it. I get like gray or red blurs. But if you say, oh, I want Taylor Swift and a Ninja Turtle hanging out, dancing, you can get that. But that's just, that's not artistic creation. That's just a... Uh, finding a couple of fun things like family guy and squishing them together and calling that a joke. So I, I wonder if the visual arts will be saved by further abstraction, the way that when photography came out, mm. art shifted. And then uh, in the 20th century abstraction came out to deal with the uh, discontents of uh, grand narratives and that kind of thing. Um, another issue with publishing that seems to be happening is audiobooks, audio AIs uh, causing some problems and some disruption. Again, on the lowest of levels, Right now, anyway, people reading for uh, people with disabilities, uh, people who are generate uh, audio books for business books that are all that are barely written in the first place, and it can't quite do artistic artistical uh, artistic uh, audio books yet, and it can't deal with a lot of it. you'll when you hear AI readings, there are a lot of mispronunciations. A couple of months ago, maybe last year, an early version of this had um, Biggie Smalls rapping 
uh, some left crafting stuff of our beats. And I woke up one morning with five people saying, is this true? Did this happen? Was Biggie a love crafting fan? I'm like, no. And I know, not only did I know historically, I know by listening, because the A couldn't talk between, between lives and lives. And Biggie knew the difference between lives and lives, and I know the difference between lives and lives. But people were so fascinated by this idea, by this gimmick. Oh, what if Biggie was into Lovecraft? Wouldn't that be cool? They weren't even listening closely to the lyrics to say, ah, you know, what no longer lives is not the lyric. It's what no longer lives. And they couldn't spot that. And it's still pretty easy to spot things because AIs, you know, they always say this in economics, the least flexible Soviet bureaucrat is infinitely more flexible than the most flexible computer program. And I think we're going to still see that, but we're going to need some kind of uh, more discernment, more of a sensibility as consumers of art to spot the differences and to spot the infelicities that AI will have to create because they have no human experiences. Yeah. That's interesting. I used to be a, a support ESL support instructor in a music composition course, and the mute and the the teacher uh, used to say it was at Academy of Art University in San Francisco, and he used to tell people. Um, remember when you're generating music electronically to to count for the rests because people can't play human beings can't play a wind instrument without a break for more than eight measures or something and people had to calculate or else it sounds like a computer wrote it that even happened to a certain extent when cds came out cds and digital recording of audio sounded so pristine and so clear that it was a little uncanny and people would go back producers would go back and add some noise add a little bit of feedback, a little bit of uh, tweaking to make it sound more rich and organic. I'm not a musician or know anything about music, but I hang out with a lot of them or did, and they'd always complain about this to me. Yeah, I definitely, I love the, I, whenever like some band that I want to, in this genre of music, I like puts like the, um, like the hiss in the background. I'm always like, oh, thank you. Like I, I do want to, I do want the experience of being on the bus, listening to my Walkman again, like, thank you for seeing me. I, I miss that sort of ambient experience of it because it, it does sound too crystal clear um, for me as well. So um, I also. Oh, you're a musician. So tell us what it's, what it's like, what's going on. Uh, well, with music, you know, there, there have been uh, things that people add back in, but there is still a quality to a room sound that can't be faked yet. I know because I know plenty of people who try to fake it and you can get around it a lot of ways, but you know, that's the quality of tape saturation was a medium that wasn't known before that, right? But then it became something, it had a feel and now you can't replicate it. There's been stuff like synthesizers and things over the years that have had some of the similar discussion of AI. This is different. But one of the things I think is hopeful is this is being driven by capitalism not hopeful, right, in its general thing. However, if you're talking about like irony and depth and complexity in all these ways, like we're not winning the capitalism war on that anyway right now. So we're the last thing that they're going to bother duplicating, putting money into duplicating quite as well, because there's no incentive. So perhaps our it's, it's like an evolutionary thing where our, our own um, lack of being edible will protect us from being eaten by the immediate future. Someone writes, I, I think about how the Surgeon General talked about how there's a loneliness pandemic and tech does not give fuzzy belongingness like person to person artistic experiences. I think we will be okay. I agree with all of that, but the last sentence. <laughs> I need more questions uh, from the, oh, we have one for Vanessa. Do you think you will ever, we'll, I will generalize this. Do you think we will ever write about your time as an organizer during COVID? In your fiction or have you already and i'll ask that to everyone are you gonna write about covid and there's been a question about this do we write about covid now do we have the era of people wearing masks and complaints in our in our fiction in the future so Vanessa, you can go first and we'll go through the rest of you for your future plans uh i'm not writing specifically about organizing during covid i am uh writing a short book uh about organizing um it's a non-fiction book it's a nonfiction book. It'll be out on Norton. Oh. And uh, yeah, it's like 40,000 words um, and it has a specific target audience. It's not written for, um, yeah. If anybody ever wants to know, you can ask me. I don't want to take up more time here, but I am writing about that. And I debated writing about that for a really long time in my fiction. Uh, everything goes into my fiction and 
the storylines don't go in. The details go in, but not the storylines. That gets, yeah. Do you have a COVID book or COVID story, Molly? Or you think possibly? Yeah, I, I have actually been debating it. It's it's interesting. I mean, um, I remember when all this was beginning, people were talking about how um, we didn't really, I mean, they used to mask um, during the great flu epidemic, um, but none of us knew that because people didn't really write about it. Um, they, they, they just were like so over it that they didn't want to put it in there. It's not in the fiction. It's not in sort of art of the time and things like that. And, um, you know, there's been, I've seen interesting conversations around like, well, I just never want to think about it ever again. And I disagree. I loved it when I saw masking in the new interview with the vampire TV show. Um, and I was like, oh, this is set in a time and a place. Like I love it's it's now, now I know when this is forever and ever. And I think that's really interesting. Um, in my own work, I have been debating whether or not I'm going to put masking in a scene. Um, it's a fantasy novel in the, the fantasy world. But at the same time, I was thinking about like, well, like it is set during the fall. Like I could indeed have people masked at this event um, in order because of the the understanding of 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 this kind of thing. And I, I have been going back and forth on it because I'm not sure if I want to write about it because I'm sick to the teeth of it. But at the same time, it could be interesting. I I, I don't know. That's my answer. Um, so maybe. We should maybe. Be. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and Max, how about you? And also as a publisher, are you getting a lot of COVID style books coming in there? A lot of uh, viral apocalypses and such? No, because I'm not open for submissions. <laughs> that never um, stops me from sending anything in. It doesn't, it stops me from reading it though. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one book I'm doing now. It's mentioned a few times, but it's not the central focus. I'm not against the idea of doing a COVID book at all. I don't have many ideas of ways to make a book just about COVID, but I, I do think it, it's a good idea to mention it once in a while to bring masking in because it's a really real thing and it feels more realistic to embrace that. But it's also made me rethink about some of the movies and books I've read and watched, specifically like zombie movies and the fact that, say like in The Walking Dead, it's incredible to me that no one has like a mask on during any of these episodes or any type of apocalyptic book will do the disease that you could get and then, oh, now you're dead or infected with something else. It's pretty incredible that no one has any type of pr protection on their bodies whatsoever. And I think COVID has like made me really uh, like a will of that when I'm watching something like they just non-existent. I similarly, I thought I would, I've, I just read Station Eleven, um, which I had passed me by, but I read a, I read her um, a more recent book, um, um, The Sea of Tranquility, and I liked it so much. I was like, I guess I should finally read Station Eleven. And um, it was so prescient in so many ways. Like there's even a scene at the beginning where the guy is buying up toilet paper. And I was like, oh my God, how did she, pred science fiction really is pr um, predictive and all these things. But like, I, I had all these feelings reading about it where I was like, man, the R not on this baby. And I was like, I hate that I know what that means now. And I also hate that I'm wondering why there wasn't like a mutation that people are still dealing with. Cause it's like pretty much over by the main part of the novel. Like people aren't really concerned with it anymore. And I was like, well, but they're hunting deer. What if there was like, a, I mean, how did it not get into the local deer population? Which is one of the things that, you know, we, we think that that's a possibility in terms of the the realities of COVID. And so um, it has changed my experience in that way as well, where I'm just sort of thinking about these things more when I read a text. And that's not a dig on Station Eleven, which was fantastic. It is the hype was real, it was good as everyone said, like absolutely. But um I I had I had cursed knowledge that changed my feelings about the events of the book. And absolutely. I don't know if I'll write about COVID per se, but I have noticed I've been when I've been tinkering with things and even in a little bit in uh the second shooter, the idea of somebody dropping a test tube by mistake <laughs> has been coming up a lot. And I don't, I don't know if I believe in conspiracy theory or, or the theory, I should say, not conspiracy theory, that it was a lab leak versus the wet market. <clears throat> but certainly the idea of one person doing one thing, this gigantic domino effect happening and covering the world afterward is something that's uh, definitely become a little bit of a thematic preoccupation. And of course, that can go for any any sorts of things, whether it and when I was a kid during the Cold War, this could be it. You know, the person who falls asleep in front of the nuclear silo and puts their coffee down, are they going to launch something? Was a, was a concern or somebody uh, 
falling asleep at a nuclear reactor was always was going to be a concern. But this idea that we're at a world at risk, where an individual tromping on that butterfly can cause massive problems, I think is coming back as a, a theme, both for myself as a writer and interestingly as a reader, it seems to be uh, back in the fray. So we'll get about 10 minutes left if we want to stick around. Do we have any more questions from anyone else? I will let you know that this is a paid performance. So you can get 10 more minutes. We've paid these people to come here and do this. So if you have a question for them, you're getting your money's worth. <laughs> or you can just sit here and buy the books. That will help us out a lot too. And if not, we can just go one more round and we'll have uh, all those little farewells with our last bit. Yeah, I passed on writing about um, COVID, but I would say that what comes to me now thinking about a lot is always loneliness, maybe because mm. I'm a teenager, that like COVID looks less like COVID to me and more like this extreme awful island in something that's been going on for a number of years of, of you know, fracturing and, and, and loneliness. And so that idea of like one vial falling, that is that idea of basic vulnerability it's a state that changes everything to live in the fact that you can't control that. As a writer, it's got its potentials, but as living through it, it, it has its possibilities too. So. What do you mean by that? Um, I mean that uh, we have become, particularly in this country, for the most part, not true for everybody, but very, you know, separate from death, separate from birth, separate from this, separate from each other, separate from that, like this idea of a permanent leisure time that nobody had, very few people have. And there's that vulnerability, be, just being something real that's always around you and also meaning it's around other people is like, there are a lot of people who didn't realize that, I think. And, uh, and it's in, in react to a different ways. And, um, you know, for me, it was a little more like, I, I, I never didn't have that, so I don't understand it, but like, I do see a difference in how people react, both good and bad. It's <laughs> interesting. It's like a loss right. of it. Max, what do you got to say for yourself before we get rolling here? Oh, you know, um... Keep it, keep it real, folks. Have a good, have a good day. Um, if you're one side and you want to put a hat on, just do it. don't, don't listen to Nick. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Hats inside. Look how cool I am. Don't you want to imagine if I was smoking a cigarette too? My God, It'd be amazing. That's all I have to say. And Molly, any last words? You have a, you have two compliments on the chat, by the way. Someone really liked the no way as can be as horny as I am, and. Uh... We don't need these cousins or these peasants to like our coffee. Thank you. Got That's a new fan. Love it. Um, no, yeah, thank you. I, I don't know. Yeah, I we're going to all just try to keep it on, I guess. You know, like, I, I think it's important. It's been interesting to see how people are keep going through all of this. And I actually find that very inspiring. I've seen, like, people do a million things that I never thought anyone, I'd ever see anyone do throughout this. And the strength of people that I've seen is sometimes like a counter, it counteracts some of the cynicism that I think it's easy to fall into. I mean, like I, and sort of my understanding too, that like people have like have a tolerance, everyone has a tolerance that is different. And I, I, I need to, I, I, I struggle with that empathy. Um, you know, I realized that I was, I was at, a, I, I went to a concert last week. I went to see, they might be giants and um, it was the, their flood reunion tour that was supposed to happen in 2020 and it got canceled in 2020 and it got canceled in 2021. And, um, I realized how judgmental I was being because I, they had asked us to wear masks and I was in a mask and all my friends that I was with were in a mask, but I saw a bunch of people at the show and they were wearing their little, they might be giant science is real shirts unmasked. And I, I had this moment where I was like, they asked us to mask and you're also, and then it was like, you know what, like who knows what they've been through? I have no idea. I don't know them. I don't know anything about them. I got laid off and I got a side hustle online, which means I have been far less exposed to this world than many people. And if they're done, I get it. I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't be that person. And so um, it has been a learning experience for me in that regard too, where I have to sort of tap into my radical empathy, I guess, um, and not just be like about it, I guess. So. so for those who weren't watching a video, she made a face and sort of turned her lip up. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sorry. I don't know how to describe the, my feeling about that, I guess. So, 
you're giving people a break. You don't want to be judgmental. Yeah, you know. I think that's good overall, that we should all give each other a break. And speaking of a break, next week you can take another break because I'm teaching a class as part of this Dispatches from Quarantine called First Person Lonesome, and I'll put the link in there. It'll be a workshop. It'll be kind of like this, but uh, you have to do stuff for me, like writing and stuff. And what I'm looking at is writing first person narratives in an environment where people spend a lot of their time alone, but are also going through a universal experience and tangling with narration and things like that. And we have other events coming up with uh, dispatches too, all of which I've just forgotten, but I have a URL. And you can click dispatches from quarantine to see what we're up to online and also here in the Bay. We have um, uh, Christina Wong in person at the Counter Pulse Theater with Rebecca Solnit um, for our next Dispatches event. And it's going to be June 12th on Monday night in the Tenderloin. And we'll be um, filming it and putting it on YouTube. And if you come, please wear a mask. Or you don't have to, but you should wear a mask. Yeah. And I'd just like to thank everyone for coming today. I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists for coming today. And I'd like to thank everybody in that unknown, hideous future who might be seeing this on YouTube years from now. If you're here, we love you. And I'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.